Hey guys, my name is Nick. I'm a Microsoft Certified Expert Administrator. Create a lot of content for MSPs. And this is part three of my five part video series I created to show you how to map Microsoft 365 business solutions to the NIST cybersecurity framework. So in these videos, I'm going through and I'm showing you the core functions of the NIST framework here, which is identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. In each video in the series, we're going through one of the functions and I'm showing you the different categories and subcategories. I'm showing you the questions you should be asking your customer to better align with the security framework itself. And I'm giving you some action items based off the Microsoft solutions that are available as well too. So today's video is about detect in that core function. So this definition is straight from NIST and it says develop and implement appropriate activities to identify the occurrence of a cybersecurity event. So when we get into the categories here, we have first anomalies and events, anomalous activities detected in a timely manner and the potential impact of events is understood. So with this one, we really need to identify what our process looks like, what our reporting looks like for our event detection, what are our policies around the threats that can come through, what are response times on those threats? What kinds of reporting do we get? Can we easily identify where it originated? What kind of attack method was used? Things of that nature. And then what are all of our data points? Many of you guys use third-party AVs. You're using Cisco Umbrella for network monitoring. Do you have an easy way to, to aggregate that data across your customers and view it in one portal? Or are you checking all that data centrally on a periodic basis? Does the customer understand the impact of those breaches? This is becoming more and more important, especially as I spoke to in other videos around the employee mindset shifting into being able to or wanting to work anywhere, anytime on any device. So you want to not restrict them from accessing their data, but you want them to do it in a secure manner. So you want them to understand the impacts of getting breached on an unprotected device, things of that nature as well too. Lastly, what alerts do we have in place for high-level threats? Are these automated? What does the process look like? Again, that comes back to response time, but it's all about evaluating what you have in place today. So with the Microsoft 365 solution, there's a ton of different security features in there and data loss features as well too. I think if you're thinking from the outset, you're mostly, your forefront of your, your thoughts are around malware and phishing, ransomware that come across a certain company, but you're not fully considering data loss prevention policies as well too. So those are sometimes more important as well because of the business critical data within a company or because of compliance regulations that you have to meet like HIPAA, for instance. So with Microsoft solutions there, they have a 99.9% .9 malware catch rate, and that is the highest in the industry. They have the lowest miss rate for phishing emails. And in 2018, they had 5 billion phishing emails blocked alone. So that solution is becoming more and more powerful. And they've integrated a lot more reporting recently as well too, which I'll show you here in this video today. So you can create automated reports that, that can be sent to you on a periodic basis. And that way you don't have to log into each portal each time. And that's pretty beneficial, especially since Partner Center doesn't allow you access into the Security and Compliance Center so you would have to log in, log out for each one of your customers. Another new feature recently introduced was enhanced filtering. So this is something where if you do have that third party AV like Barracuda or WebRoot or Proofpoint or something like that in place, you've set up that connector in Office 365 to filter your email. And with this advanced filtering feature that they introduced, it allows for a skip listing, which is where it's looking back at the original IP address of which a message was sent. So a couple different ways of which that's beneficial. One is you're able to leverage Microsoft Security Graph and all of the data and they get from various endpoints across their entire stack all day. So you have technically a second layer of protection where it's checking against your current AV, but then also looking at Microsoft's fast security graph data as well too, to try to assess if this is actually malicious. And then secondly, with advanced threat protection, there is a lot of machine learning capabilities from the sense of it tracking where a user typically gets email, sends email, and it can better protect against these threats if it has the original IP address versus just getting what's being sent from Barracuda, for instance. 
So that's pretty cool. Definitely would check that out. And lastly, there you have DKIM and DMARC that you can configure as well. So within that portal, you can set these things up. But as you'll notice here, it's an authentication process to help senders and recipients from forge and phishing email. So it's a digital signature that you're sending a part of the email to prove that you are sending from the correct organization. It wasn't modified after they were sent. With these, they're pretty easy to set up. There's some DNS settings that you have to add, but overall, it doesn't take that long to implement that as a solution. So this is the threat dashboard within Office 365 Security and Compliance Center. And this is something where you can see an aggregated account of all the data points that they're collecting and insights from phishing, from spoofing, from malware, and you can dive down into those. Additionally, I wanted to show you some of the new features they recently introduced. If you go into the threat protection status, you'll see here on this page, you have the ability to filter through, and this is a test tenant, so there's not any data in here. I just wanted to show you the points of data that you can drill down into. So you have malicious emails and content, but you can granularly define what you want to look at and you can create a schedule of a report that can be sent to you on a periodic basis. So you see here, this helps you understand what kind of threats are coming into the organization to help you better refine policies around that or the protection for end users, the kind of training that you want to do based off the threat. So this is really new. This just came out in February here um, as far as the granularity, but you can create schedules based off of certain things that you would like to see. And that's always beneficial to show the customer in a QBR or something like that as well too, because then you're just showing your value of this is actually how much this, this offering that you're paying for did for you this month. And then the other half of that that I mentioned is the DLP policies that you can set up. So again, you can say, I want to look for sensitive data. And if it's detected, I want to have a policy tip that shows up and this will tell you how many times that's triggered and then false positives and overrides, you can have the user or give the user the ability to override and say, I want to send it anyway. But when they do that, they have to type in a reason they're doing it. So that's, that's a beneficial way to roll this out too, if you're going to do it in phases, because then you can at least track and have an audit trail of what they're actually using the override for, and you're not actually blocking them from doing so. So within the Security and Compliance Center, you can come up to the Data Loss Prevention, click on Policies. And when I go to create a policy here, you'll notice that there's preset templates that we can choose from that'll detect certain PII or information. And they're directly related in most cases to the compliance regulation. So HIPAA, for instance, right here, It'll look for PII, like social security numbers, credit card information, first name, last name, things like that, that could be attached in an email. And this also spans across SharePoint, OneDrive, and Teams as well too, if you want. So it can get really granular. You can define all these things in your policy and set those locations and set up more granular settings as far as what users can actually do from the standpoint of being blocked altogether or just getting a policy tip. So with the business case here, you have MSP that's using a AVAS with WebRooter Proofpoint. You want to bundle on ATP. So you want to leverage the entire stack of services that it has as an offering. And a big part of that is the machine learning capabilities. So you set up advanced filtering to get the skip listing functionality you need to have better reporting, better detect these threats as well too. So some action items, I would definitely go in, if you aren't already, make the review of the threat management dashboard part of a quarterly process that you constantly review. You want to go in and refine policies as the landscape shifts, and you want to see trends in the tenants so you can better protect them over time. This doesn't take very long, but I definitely recommend planning that out. And if you have a team, spreading the work across them as well too. Make sure that if you do use their party tools for security, you are aggregating all this data so you can see it in one spot and you're maximizing the changes that you make across multiple solutions. So then you wanna send them the reports as well. 
to show, you know, this is how many safe links and safe attachments were quarantined. This was how many times you got spoofed and we protected you. You want to set up the policies for ATP, safe links, safe attachments, and for anti-phishing. I touched on this in the protect section in the last video, but you do want to set up some more granular policies around CEO, CFOs of the company that would be likely to get spear fished. And then you have your enhanced filtering that we've touched on multiple times. Implement DMARC and DKIM for trusted sending. Configure the DLP policies to protect sensitive data if there is in the company, or at least give policy tips. So people are starting to get into the mindset of, oh, maybe I shouldn't send this to an external domain, or maybe I shouldn't be just attaching credit card information in an email message. So it's all about awareness and you want to drive a solution that is going to leave users compliant and adopt it completely. So I think the best approach is to do it out in phases with those policy tips. So they're getting in their head that this is the way I should be doing this before you just prevent it altogether. Because most likely those things weren't in place already. And unless you're having to conform to certain compliance regulations, then that's something that I would still slowly roll out as well. So the next category we have here is the security continuous monitoring. And with this one, the information system and assets are monitored at discrete intervals to identify cybersecurity events and verify the effectiveness of protective measures. So this is really looking at your solution and saying, how periodic do we review this as far as the policies that are in place? How uh, periodic are we reviewing the analytics behind all the security and endpoints that we are protecting? Are there any policies we should modify? And I think it's best to revisit how external users are accessing resources at the company. What do those contracts look like if they're constant suppliers or outside contractors? Or how do the users send company data to external employees? That's a, that's a big, uh, external companies I should say, that's a big factor that you should definitely be evaluating on a periodic basis. So with M365, you do have, again, the security centers where this consolidation of reporting is going to come from. You have the capabilities to create alerts. And with that, you do have predefined alerts here that they will send the admins emails on that are pretty good as far as elevated permissions or email reports from the users being malware. So there's already triggers in place. Uh, but you can create your own alert policy and you can set um, custom name, severity, things like that and select the category as well. So when you go through here, you can click next and then you can say, what is this common activity? So there's conditions again that you can set and if it's detected, it can give you an alert as well. So I highly encourage you viewing this and making sure that if there's anything that is common to this tenant that's a high risk that you create alert off of it because that'll help you track down the issue much quicker than if you just get an email from the end user for instance so intune is the other piece of this if you're using the mdm solution with microsoft you have a bunch of compliance policies that you can set up on that device platform there's tons of granular control though in the policies that you can set up and they're only going to evolve over time. So that's something else that I would view on a periodic basis just to make sure there's no new threats that have come through where you need to reevaluate those policies or add some more restriction into what makes that device a healthy device. So this is the other security and compliance dashboard. This is their new portal where everything's going to move to over time. And right now this is getting a lot better from the sense of being able to see this granular data. You can see device compliance from the sense of Intune. And the higher up you go in the Azure AD premium SKUs, if you wanted to bolt that on, the more reporting you'll get from an identity perspective and an app perspective as well too. Business case here, you don't have a periodic basis once you review the security trends. It may be something that you're just reacting right now where they open up cases and you get these tickets in and you're, you're moving ad hoc throughout the company as far as just resolving them over and over. I think it's best though to have a periodic review dates for those and to evaluate what's going on in the tenant 
so you can collectively see what you need to change or more restrictive policies to put in. So you want to monitor the threat management dashboard. You want to send those custom alerts to you as the admin or to your ticketing system would be great as well too. The same with the custom reports. So you don't have to log into the attendant each time. And you need to have more restrictive policies in place if you are seeing a trend that is heavy attack from any avenue or, or method or something of that nature too. So action items here, review the tenant dashboard and then send these reports to the customers. Some customers will ask for them just because they wanna see that information, but other times you can just provide more value in a QBR by saying, hey, these are the amount of emails that were sent and received. And then these are all the things that this solution provided as far as protecting you as a company. Next category here, detection processes. Detection processes and procedures are maintained and tested to ensure the awareness of anomalous events. So this is one defining roles and responsibilities for detection of events. Do you have that defined? How does the flow of communication work between you and the customer? When a ticket is opened, how do you triage the ticket on your side? You may be a smaller MSP doing a lot of this yourself, you still want to have a clear cut foundation of how you triage a ticket and the columns that it moves through to completion so that it's a redefinable process, it's a reteachable process. So as you begin to grow as an MSP, you can easily hand that off to somebody who can understand and easily pick up where you left off and slowly integrate into your existing systems because the foundation is so solid. It's the same process over and over again. Have you tested your detection process that are in place with your, your security stack? This one's huge. As threats evolve, you constantly need to make sure that your detection processes are, the integrity of them, I should say, is something where there's no breakdowns. You haven't made an update, you're not getting alerts to connect wise in the sense of a ticketing system. So you constantly need to evaluate that too. How is event detection communicated at the end user? So again, end-to-end -end communication, how do they open up tickets? Is it the same process every time for them or are they doing it in various ways? How often do you review your detection processes with the customer? So make sure they understand. If you, if you change something on your end, you definitely need to get ahead of that and communicate it with the end users before you hard implement something and, and view that to make sure there's no loopholes. Security Center is a consistent theme with today's video. Um, we have the assume breach mentality from Microsoft. This is something where if you adopt this as well too, I think you're gonna find that you'll define processes a lot better because you're saying we're in ground zero. We're, we are at a state where we need to move quickly here. How can we do this in the most efficient way possible? How can we communicate it? How can we track it? And what does that actually look like from end to end between us and the customer? So defining that and understanding what that looks like is always gonna be a best practice. So this is a clear customer case that I feel like comes up a lot where they're starting to send you problems in many different avenues. That may be chat, that may be text, that may be over phone or email, they're just calling you. And there's no real formal process that, that you've clearly expressed to them that they have to do, or they're a big enough customer, they have a little bit of power over you, and they're saying, you know, I, I demand premium level support. But you still have to find these processes in place and giving these expectations to the customer about how they report incidents to you is going to be very important in the forefront of your conversations and giving them a reason why in the business sense. You, don't, you can't talk nerd to them the entire time and expect them to adopt your process. You have to relate it back to their business, show how it will improve your efficiencies, and also get you back into a healthy state in a minimal amount of time. So you wanna track that. You wanna make sure your technicians are not performing these functions ad hoc each time they get that request. It's the same process over and over again. So that's very repeatable to other engineers that may come on. And it's very consistent from the communication standpoint. So some action items here, review your event detection process and make sure that it's clearly communicated with the end users at the company. Review it quarterly, see if there's anything you can improve on, any policies that you need to tighten down, any awareness training that you can provide to the customer and incorporate that threat management dashboard as part of your event 
event detection process. So make sure that you're leveraging the deep reporting that Microsoft is getting from all the endpoints. 6.5 billion signals are sent across the entire stack with Azure, with user detection, with device detection. So getting a lot of data and they have a lot of protection that comes along with that. So definitely leverage that and leverage the dashboard so you can provide better QBR data to your customer as well. That's everything I had for this video. If you guys have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below. Next part four, we have the respond core function. So I'll see you guys there.